we're moving to the topic of the session this afternoon, discipling people in the new economy. As science, technology, artificial intelligence, and machine learning are powerfully progressing in the present, two corollaries are becoming evident in the emerging future. The evolution of a new economy and the revolution of the world of work. Modernity has brought us more, more wealth, more abundance, and more waste. Humans have experienced increase in body size, length of life, and the quantity of information and options available to them. Instead of overcoming scarcity, one of the major problems of the past, the challenge before society in the future will be in managing abundance, yet perhaps not abundance for all. Work is changing too. Repetitive work has been reduced for today's workers, and this trend will continue. One study suggests that 60% of all jobs are 30% automatable. Further, instead of seeking security, as their parents did, in a job at the plant or office that they could keep for 40 years until retirement, today's workers prefer flexibility and non-standard work arrangements. Yet these same new trends and technologies that are reducing repetition and increasing flexibility are also disrupting the traditional world of work, not only in the service sector, but also in the professions. Law, accounting, medicine, and architecture. Across the employment spectrum, there's a lot of fear and anxiety that jobs will be eliminated and workers made redundant. One machine can displace hundreds of unskilled workers. And people who are highly skilled, even in really challenging fields, are finding themselves out of work. Like the music pastor with a PhD in pipe organ whose church has decided to go with a rock band. Or the full-time professor who's been replaced by three adjuncts. How can these folks find meaningful employment? Is it even possible for people to flourish without a job? Where do they find their meaning and identity, value? How do they make a contribution? How do they access resources for a minimally decent lifestyle? Or, should people even stay in jobs that are malforming them? But what about the 80% of workers in the world who don't even have the agency to choose or to change jobs? What can the church do to support, to strategize, and shape people Christianly in this time of socioeconomic seismic activity? As Christ followers, seminary professors, pastors, and students. The Great Commission calls us to discipleship in every part of our lives, including work. How are we to be disciples of Jesus Christ? How are we to make disciples for him in the new economy? How do we think about these new challenges? How can we be preparing ourselves and those we serve for the changing world of work. Coming first to begin this discussion with a 20-minute presentation are two people who have been focusing on discipling people in the new economy in the Pittsburgh area. They're Lisa Slayton and Terry Tim. Lisa Slayton was, until recently, the head of the Pittsburgh Leadership Foundation, which specializes in discipling leaders for church and the marketplace. Lisa recently left PLF to form her own consulting firm, Tamim Partners, taking the Hebrew word to mean 
wholehearted commitment, living with integrity. As wise guides, Tamim partners build the capacity and capability to lead out of one's identity from a deep coherence as they travel through a world of complexity. And Terry Tim serves as lead pastor of Christ Community Church in the Hills and co-leader of the City Network in Pittsburgh in Made to Flourish. With a background in music, education, theology, and leadership, Terry is also author of a book, A Movable Feast, Worship for the Other Six Days, which shifts our focus from being consumers of worship experience to being worshipers who are consumed with a deep love and devotion for Jesus Christ all week long. Welcome with me, Lisa and Terry. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's good to be here. Um, hopefully, you've all had a good dose of that fabulous refugee coffee, which got us all stimulated for the afternoon. This is, this is not nap time. Um, <clears throat> I began thinking about, I've been involved in the faith and work movement uh, for going on 20 years, um, and uh, in, in a whole variety of ways, first in my local church, and then in my work through the Pittsburgh Leadership Foundation, and now at Tamim Partners. And Terry and I have been on this journey together. We met on an airplane more than 10 years ago, uh, headed to a, con actually we weren't, we never actually got on that airplane, did we? It was, we sat in the airport together wondering how we were gonna get to a conference in Austin, and, and ended up building a relationship and, and doing all kinds of fun work together in Pittsburgh. Um, and I love the faith and work movement. I love what's happened over many, many years now of helping uh, local pastors and congregations think through how to integrate faith into everyday work <coughs> for, their, for their members. Um, but what I have noticed uh, over many, many years, um, and, and I'll comment on this in a couple different ways, is that the faith and work movement has largely, until very recently, been oriented towards those of us who sit, to, your, to use your language, Kitty, of, you know, the, the top of the heap, right? Um, it's been oriented towards those of us who are educated, who have professional jobs, uh, who can consume this information intellectually um, and through a certain kind of, of reception, and it is not been so accessible to what I would call everyday workers. Um, and several years ago, uh, I heard Catherine Leary Alsdorf, who many of you know, uh, I would consider her one of our, uh, our mentors and leaders in this movement, say something that struck me very deeply. She said, uh, as we move into this new world of work, our workplaces and not our churches are going to be the primary place of formation for our people. So how are we preparing our people to not be formed by their workplaces, but to bring their formation into their workplaces? Very interesting perspective. Not long after that, I sat with an African-American pastor in Pittsburgh, a, a remarkable guy named Stan Holbrook, who was deeply committed to bringing a theology of work into his very vulnerable community outside of Pittsburgh. And he said to me, Lisa, I don't know how to help my people understand. They view work as a, a horrible thing that it's just a means to an end. And in most cases, they have very little agency in their choices around work in our community. And he said, I want them to reimagine their work as part of how they can be redemptive in the world. And I said, Stan, do you think work is a form of biblical justice? And he said, yes. He said, work is justice. And this idea of just work became, kind of got, got cultivated in, in what we were thinking about at that time at the Pittsburgh Leadership Foundation. Debbie gave us a really great introduction. If you look at the Gallup statistics over 20 plus years now that Gallup's been doing research, the engagement of workers isn't getting better despite all of Gallup's great things on strength finders and all this other kind of stuff. It's helpful, but it's not really moving the needle on workers really coming and bringing the best of who they are. Gallup calls, describes engagement engagement as bringing discretionary effort, right, the best of who we are into our workplaces. So I want to talk, we're going to talk today both in a little bit theoretically and then very practically about how we can reconsider work through the lens of God's justice in the world. Is work a primary means of, of justice and redemption in the world that we're a part of today? And I think it's going to look very different in the new economy that's emerging here. 
Uh, a few years ago, I heard, uh, you heard me talk, for those of you who are here this morning, a little bit about how we are navigating a world of complexity, right? Um, and it requires very different tools and resources to, to address big issues and challenges. Um, one of the first places I heard about this was when I heard a little phrase uh, called, uh, we live in a VUCA world. Has anybody ever heard this phrase, VUCA, familiar with it? Yeah, VUCA was a term that was developed in the military in the 90s, um, and it's an acronym, and it stands for volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And basically what the military was saying to its soldiers and the people that it was equipping to go into battle was, we have done everything we do to know, know how to do to equip you for battle, and we're pretty sure most of it's not gonna work. So be prepared. You're going into volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous situations, and do the best you can with the preparation, but we need to reimagine how you're going to engage these highly hostile and volatile conditions from a very different vantage point. I think the world of work is in a state of VUCA, right? It is, we are, particularly for those of us in leadership positions, recognizing that there is, it is a volatile work world out there for all the reasons that Debbie just described. I think there, there's a, a, a tension that we're living in. First is, uh, there's, a, there's been a lot written over the last couple years. Matt Rustin from Made to Flourish wrote a great article on this. The National Review has published some really good stuff. There's a religion that's emerged, and it's the religion of workism, right, where people are so attached to the work that they do that they're deriving their identity from their work. And when that work changes and goes away, their identity disintegrates. <clears throat> On the other end of the spectrum, we have people who are being so malformed by their work that their identities are being destroyed and threatened at the other end of the spectrum. So both of these things are true. <clears throat> when we really sat down practically to begin to think about what, what just work meant and the implications of it, for our own sakes more than anything else, we broadly defined what we called five archetypes of workers in the new economy outside of the professional or educated knowledge worker. And Terry's gonna unpack for us a little bit about those archetypes, um, more to give us handles to think about than to try and categorize people. So I want you to keep that in mind as you listen in. This is a reminder, uh, last night Greg Jones brought that phrase, the story of everything. And I think it's very important when we think about work do we really have this inclusive view of not only work, but workers? So here's a sketch of five archetypes. First, workers who are not compensated, contributors to the economy, but they're not compensated. Stay-at-home parents or grandparents who give care to their grandchildren, those who care for the elderly or the chronically ill, people who are retired, students, volunteers, the unemployed, people who are contributing to the economy, but not compensated. And these people, uh, their work is vital because really at the heart of all work, it's about contribution first and not compensation. There may not be a paycheck, but there's always meaningful work to be done. Secondly, hourly wage earners people who work in retail, food service, the service economy, laborers, seasonal workers, people who work in the gig economy or the on-demand economy. I took a, a ride share to the airport to come here and I love talking to, to my drivers and Jeff was my driver and, and I asked him a little bit about his work story. He works at a hardware store and he fills in the gaps uh, during seasons when work is slow and he drives for a, a rideshare company. And I said, what do you love most about your, your job? And he said, the people. I love meeting people. I love having conversations with people. And I said, what do you dislike most about your job? And he said, the company I work for. <laughs> and I'll summarize our conversation around that point. He said, I'm a means to their end. Third high-skilled artisans and craftsmen, creatives, musicians, actors, filmmakers, visual artists, chefs, and as well, people in that trade space, carpenters, plumbers, electricians, construction workers, road construction folks, mechanics. These people are undervalued and their work is 
often unappreciated until we miss it. And we need what they bring to the table. A man in my congregation has started a, a company, Sim Coach Games, and they make video games. And they're not the kind of video games that you probably are thinking of when you hear that phrase, video games. Their mission is to create fun video games that inspire and connect youth to relevant career paths. And their target audience is 14 to 18 year old, particularly men, and they're helping cast a vision. We need people who will work on roads. We need carpenters. We need these kinds of trades to support the infrastructure. And they're trying to inspire and value and help youth move into that space of the trades. Fourth, office workers and desk workers. Think cube workers in companies and corporations. Think career, government, or military personnel. Think denominational church workers. <laughs> I think about our sisters and brothers in the Methodist stream right now and all that's happening in that space and the tension and the anxiety. People who keep the trains running yet have little or no influence about decisions that are being made. They implement without influence but their work is vital to the well-being of companies and communities and organizations and institutions. And then lastly, the highly marginalized workers, people who need opportunity, immigrants, refugees, perhaps veterans who are coming back into the public sector, people who need a second chance, people with criminal convictions, people who need long-term support, people who perhaps have a physical or mental or emotional disability. Pope Francis said, work anoints humanity with dignity. And yet so often there are people with capacity, with energy, with experience, with a desire to work, but there's no space for them to contribute. And so keep in mind those, those five archetypes as we continue this conversation. Yeah, and what we what we really paid attention to as we were as we were defining these broad categories of people was what is the threat to their identity? Um, how how is their identity being undermined in some way because of their their on the continuum of what what our friend Amy Sherman calls vocational power, their limited agency or their limited vocational power? We know here in this room that our identity comes first and foremost from Jesus Christ, and yet many of us still struggle with deriving for our identity from our success and our accomplishments and our visibility and the books we've published and all of those things. On the other end of the spectrum, when we think about the 80 or 90 percent of workers out there whose identity is under threat, um, <clears throat> they, are, they are often a, a marginalized worker, someone who's trying to recover from coming out of prison or from a, an addiction. Their, their identity may have actually been destroyed in the process, and they are rebuilding. How does a woman like Rachel Denhollander sit up here with the kind of courage that she demonstrated this morning, knowing first and foremost that her identity is in Christ, and having to have rebuilt it in a new way after recovering from the kinds of physical and emotional and spiritual trauma that she experienced. These people do not have the same resources necessarily. Their identities are undervalued. They've been muted. They've been marginalized in some way. And I think the, the work of discipling people in the, new in the new economy is bringing them back to ways for them in their worlds to understand first and foremost where the identity, their identity comes from. For the next few minutes, Terry, and I'm gonna add just color commentary, is gonna share a few stories as a pastor of how he's reimagined discipling um, in this new economy with a couple of stories from his congregation. I'm great at color commentary, by the way. <laughs> she really is. <laughs> So I want to begin by sharing just a little bit about my own vocational journey. Uh, as, as Debbie mentioned, my background's in music. Uh, I'm a trained musician. Uh, and as a person entering uh, a young adulthood, the last place I ever imagined working would be a church. But God had another plan. And through a great uh, church community, uh, they helped me discern God's call to serve the church. 
And it was a major transition uh, in my life. I never expected it. I never saw it coming. And that church helped me discern that call and got me on a track into a good seminary where I spent three years gaining a robust theological education. And then that seminary sent me out to pastor a local church. I was clueless. And over the years of my ministry, I tried to take up this role of shepherding the people that God had entrusted to me in many, many different ways. I, I, I reinvented myself as a pastor. I just ticked out a couple of these ways that I approached my work. For a while, I was the resident theologian. For a while, I was teacher, communicator, motivational speaker. There were seasons when I was community developer, or visionary, or strategic leader, social activist, networker. I was trying to figure out what did it mean for me to be a pastor and to shepherd the people God entrusted to me. And really it was about 10 or 12 years ago on my own vocational journey that I decided I needed to turn in my pastoral card. That didn't work for me in the traditional sense of doing the pastoral kinds of things and I job crafted for myself. And I selected a new job description that described how I needed to embody my work as a pastor, and I became a vocational coach. And my work now in my church as lead pastor is simply but profoundly to help people discern and then faithfully respond to God's call in their life, in the places they live, learn, work, serve, and play. And whatever I do, from the pulpit, from my office, strategic planning with my leaders, it's all in that space of helping people discern their call and then respond to it faithfully. Let me just tell you a couple of stories about people that I interact with and coach in my congregation. Dan. Dan's a 30-something guy. He's a big man, but he has a tender heart. And Dan grew up in a church in a tradition where there was clearly a hierarchy of value of work. Missionary, pastor, and if you couldn't cut it in those spaces, maybe you should work in the social sector and work with vulnerable, needy people. And Dan had a big heart for people, but he knew he wasn't cut out for the missionary pastor thing, so he did the next best thing. He got a sociology degree and a psychology degree, and he began to work in the social service field. He was doing good work, helping vulnerable people. But it wasn't the best fit for him, and he didn't feel like he was contributing the way God wanted him to contribute. He loved working with his hands. He loved working outside. And after having established a career in the social service sector, having a wife and family, he discerned a call that God was inviting him to leave that workspace and become an apprentice carpenter. And he's gone through the hard, laborious process of learning a skill from the bottom up. And now Dan's specialty as a carpenter is building scaffolding. And I drive all through my city, and I see the work of Dan's hands as he's built scaffolding that supports the construction and the renovation that's going on all throughout our city. Dan's story is this reminder that in my work as a vocational coach, what is kingdom work? Anna is a 30-something mom, highly educated, highly successful in her work, and she now stays at home and is the parent for two young children. Anna said this to me once. She said, I used to be a person, but now I'm simply my children's mother. Mm. I've lost my sense of personhood and identity. We've had long conversations about the value of contributing without being compensated. We've had long conversations about what does it mean to be a caregiver? What does it mean to icon, to image God who is the ultimate caregiver and to bring that value to her work and to see her work valuable in that light? She models the caregiving nature and character of God day in and day out. 
we do a little thing sometimes at the end of our services, this time tomorrow. And as a way of uh, sending people out, I just ask people in the congregation, this time tomorrow, what will you be doing? And I remember one Sunday morning, I, I asked Danielle, and she sheepishly said to me, tomorrow at this time, I'm going to be making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Mm. And her ha husband turned beet red. He was so embarrassed because he did not appropriately value the work of making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And so we've had this long conversation about what does it mean to model and image God as a caregiver. You know, there's a, uh, a woman that I got to meet a couple of years ago um, who's taken the, the, the work of valuing caregivers to a whole new level. Her name is Jessica Kim. Um, if some of you know uh, the Praxis organization, you may be familiar with Jessica's work. She's a serial entrepreneur. Um, she's probably in her early 40s now, lives up in the Boston area, um, started entrepreneurial ventures as young as high school and college. Um, and several years ago, Jessica's mother, uh, she's Asian um, by background, and so there's a strong uh, familial connection, and, and, and Jessica's mother became uh, very ill and unexpectedly and, and young. And Jessica stepped back from her work. She had young children at the time, um, but she stepped back from her work primarily to give care to her mother as her mother was dying. And this, this process took over two years, and her mother passed, and she grieved. And she realized how lonely she had become in this process. And she knew that she had to do something, but she wasn't quite sure what. And what, what, the, what the entrepreneur in her said is there has to be a way to connect lonely caregivers. And she's a technology entrepreneur, and so she gathered some people together. And about a year and a half ago, she launched a business called Iana Care, I-A-N-A -A Care, if you can find it on the internet. And I-A-N-A -A stands for I Am Not Alone. And it's a social platform that you can join and can become a part of, and it resources you. If you're staying at home making peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, or if you're caring for an elderly parent or someone who's ill in your family or a disabled family member, because it's a lonely business and it can be exhausting. And Jessica said there has to be a way to connect these people and resource them. We are meant and made for community. Redemptive entrepreneurship is what Praxis is all about, and they've helped equip Jessica to think about this. So now there's this community out there that's helping to value deeply the work of contributed, the, 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 the value of contributed work through people like Danielle and Anna that, that Terry describes in his church. Let me just tell you one last quick story, Jay. Jay is the most uh, creative, gifted artist I've ever come across in my life. He was a rising star in his field until he committed a crime and he was convicted of a felony and sentenced to prison. He spent four years in prison, and he has come out of that space, and he found it very difficult, almost impossible, to find meaningful work with a four-year gap on your resume. There was a small business owner who saw in Jay leadership capacity, organizational skill, and he gave him a second chance. And Jay worked diligently in that space to grow the business and to create order out of disorder. And when that small business owner decided to sell the business, he sold a portion of that company to Jay. And now Jay is committed to using his platform to provide employment opportunities to other highly marginalized workers. It's a story of second chances, of opportunity, and justice. I'm going to bring our time to a close with a, a, a story that will maybe be familiar to many of you. Um, I don't know that there's one person who's more iconic in our minds when we think about the cause of justice, and particularly justice and race, as, as there would be with Dr. Martin Luther King. And you may remember, uh, I heard this story told last year and was reminded of it again um, in an article Dr. Craig, Greg Thompson spoke at the Jubilee Conference last year about the restoration of culture. And he reminded us that Dr. King went to Memphis, the last speech he gave, he went to Memphis to speak to 
the economic conditions of the city, to the laborers, to the garbage collectors. Right? And we remember the glorious speech that he gave, and I'm going to quote from it here. It says, it's all right to talk about long white robes over yonder and all of its symbolism, but ultimately people want some suits and dresses and shoes to wear down here. It's all right to talk about streets flowing with milk and honey, but God has commanded us to be concerned about the slums down here and his children who can't eat three square meals a day. In his final days, he shared this hope, saying, I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain, and I looked over, and I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know that we as a people will get to the promised land. And what was Dr. King referring to? when he said he would see the promised land. He had looked over the mountain and seen the promised land in the garbage collectors marching the streets of Memphis for economic restoration in their city. When we think about vocation and identity and work and justice, we cannot just think about the vocation of the academic theologian or the professor or the doctor. We have to think about just work and the vocation of the garbage collector. And I think that's the story that, that the faith and work movement needs to take up in its next season in some very profound ways. So thank you. Thank you so much, Lisa and Terry, for sharing your keen insights and meaningful experiences. I'd like now to invite anyone who has started to come up with some questions uh, to feel free to use the Slido app or the website. Uh, you can start contributing your questions. Remember, you go to slido.com or the Slido app and enter KF20. You may submit questions or vote for other questions you'd want to hear. Now, at this time, I'd like to invite our three panelists to come and join our presenters. And our three panelists are Christine Rico from Apple Computer, Delano Sheffield from Macedonia Baptist Church, and Michaela O'Donnell Long from Fuller Theological Seminary. Please come, and I'll introduce you while you're coming. Thank you. Christine Rico is the co-leader of the Apple Christian Employee Resource Group, the Affinity Group for Christians at Apple Computer, Cupertino, California, where she leads experience innovation, experienced innovations. She is involved in the faith and work movement on many levels from global to local, having recently launched a consultancy called Faith and Work Faith and Work Workshop for people who want to start Christian affinity groups for businesses across Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley. Uh, Delano Sheffield is from the Macedonia Baptist Church. Delano is a thought leader in Kansas City, Missouri, where he has served as a structural engineer, a discipleship pastor at Macedonia Baptist Church, and a city network leader for Made to Flourish in the faith, work, and economy movement. Michaela O'Donnell Long is from Fuller Seminary. She is Senior Director of Fuller's Dupree Center for Leadership. And we know uh, our Quran fellow, Mark Roberts, they work together. At Fuller, she's also an adjunct professor of practical theology and leadership. Her doctoral dissertation is Adopting an Entrepreneurial Posture vocational formation for the changing world of work. In addition to her academic work, Michaela co-owns a creative agency with her husband. Their business is called Long Winter Media. Panelists, we're so honored to have you. What a, what a wonderful and diverse audience. This is just wonderful. We're beginning by letting each of the panelists have about five minutes to respond to the presentation, and then we'll start with some questions and then receive some of yours as well. Hello. Thank you so much, Debbie and Lisa and Terry. Um, I know what y'all are thinking. They're Christians in Silicon Valley? <laughs> Just kidding. Um, yes, there are. There are. Um, God has us everywhere, which is a blessing. 
Um, and I just want to, you know, start off by wishing everybody a happy new year, right? Happy new year, happy new decade, new economy apparently, and, you know, living in an increasingly VUCA world. Amen. <laughs> Yet, you know, I, I, am, I am grateful that as a follower of Jesus Christ, there are truths that I can live by that don't change. And two of them being the fact that I am a sinner in desperate need of a savior. And the good news is God, out of his love for this world, his love for me, made me alive through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And with that, because of who God is and who he says I am, what I do, including the work I do at Apple, matters. Um, and it's, you know, these truths, you know, I, I think increasingly in a, in a complex VUCA world, there is so much noise that the challenge um, for the local church and in this idea of discipling for the the next generation and the new economy is to actually, let's just stick to the things that we know to be true. Let's keep it simple. Um, and so there, you know, in response to this, I love all the examples and the stories and, and, um, and everything from, from the past two days. Um, but I, I personally am not a theologian. I have a very simple mind. And so I just, I, I, I go to three questions. And I just wonder, you know, what, what would it look like if all Christians who go to a local church were to, you know, leave their local church and live out their lives with a personal and practical response to these three questions, and they would remember their response to these three questions every moment of every day. And the three questions are, who is God? Who is God? Who does God say I am? And why do I do what I do? Who is God, right? God is the ruler and the creator of all things. He's the Lord of all lords, the king of all kings. He's also my heavenly father, and my friend, all at the same time. Who does God say I am? I am a daughter of the Most High King. Mm -hmm. I'm a minister of reconciliation. I am God's workmanship, his masterpiece. And why do I do what, what I do? Because of the finished work of Jesus on the cross, because of the gospel, and because of that, my work, what I do, matters. And it's through this lens, the foundation of these, you know, my personal responses to these three questions, that then what I do every day, the ordinary then becomes extraordinary. But the challenge is often, you know, those of us quote unquote average Christians that don't have <laughs> theological degrees, often we're we don't have resp ready responses to those three basic questions and are not able to be conscious of, our, of the answers to those three. So who is God? Who does God say I am? And why do I do what I do? But I do believe that if and, and when Christians have a ready response to those three questions and can remain conscious of their personal responses to them, the way that we live our lives and the way we look to this world will be different. I think um, my childhood some of the things that you all mentioned and made me think about it. Product of a principal and a sixth, seventh, eighth grade English social study teacher. A few things I realized very early. One, I don't remember doing a whole lot of homework. They didn't really push to do homework, but I also realized very early that the classroom didn't end in the four walls. Uh, my mom was perpetually asking me questions wherever we're going. What is, there's a Catholic facility there. I wonder what they're doing there. And I thought it was rhetorical. And then she would look at me and say, no, what are they doing in there? 
Um, the questions never ended, and she expected answers. They didn't have to be perfect answers, but she expected them to be um, answered. And I think what, when we talk about just work and thinking about these other areas, um, there's a um, agricultural economist at K-State. He's actually the first tenured black um, professor uh, very recently, which says something about our history in America. But he makes the point, um, as he's been kind of mentoring me, when we ask the wrong questions, we devote our resources to wrong solutions. Mm. And when, um, and I add on to that to say that um, when we are the ones asking all the questions, we're essentially telling people that their questions and their solutions aren't sufficient enough. So I think what we all collectively have to do, what I've seen my mom do for me when I was very young, is that every person's questions are valuable. And perhaps the questions for those who are in these areas, these archetypes, are the best questions that we should be asking. And perhaps their answers are the ones that we really need to hear from. Um, we tend to uh, bottle the questions and, and think that we've got the solutions, but it may be in those very people um, that, that are in um, these areas that they have the things that we need to know. Um, and I think essentially what that does is if we are affirming the dignity of every person, um, then those who are on the fringes are sufficient to be able to answer the questions that we all need to, to know. You know, far be it from us to remove those people who are in those areas as uh, resident experts in those areas to be able to give us what we need to know. Amen. Yeah, I, I definitely consider myself part of that like high privilege, like top tier, yet I resonate with so much of what you all described. Um, and part of that is really reflected in my own personal story. Uh, my, both my husband and I graduated seminary in 2010, 2011, which was like right in the thick of the recession. And as you may uh, not be surprised to hear, theology is not a very marketable skill in a recession. And we very quickly found ourselves like without work in LA and every nonprofit we liked or you know, sort of um, church we thought we might work at was not only like on a hiring freeze, they were laying people off. There was like nothing. And we were in LA and uh, we loved LA and LA is very expensive. And we were like, oh no, what are we gonna do? And I come from a family of teachers and entrepreneurs and I had gone to seminary thinking that someday I would do a PhD and become a professor. And in that moment, I was like, we gotta start a business. That's what we need to do. That is the solution to our problem here. Uh, and that's actually what Dan and I did. We started a business and quickly found ourselves as part of the independent economy. And um, man, I, it, it sort of like in some cases felt really like exciting and energizing. And in other days, especially when things weren't going as well, it felt really terrifying. Right? And I looked around um, left and right in LA specifically, people were either working like six jobs to try to make ends meet, or they were part of this like high craftsman artisan skill where they were like, this is what I am called to do, but it's not exactly turning into income. And there was just this whole like category of people, many of them my seminary colleagues, and many of them people that we started to meet uh, as we developed this creative agency. And Dan and I would literally, we'd host dinner parties. We had our friend Brandon build us a 14 foot long table mm -hmm. that went in our backyard. It filled up like our whole backyard in LA. And we would gather around it and we'd tell people like, bring a bottle of wine, we'll make some food, and we'll just talk. And every single night, the conversations went to, but things feel so different. I didn't really expect this. I'm trying to do something more meaningful with my work. And it was like, you know, VUCA, VUCA all over, you know, yeah. all over the place. And I started to get a picture that, you know, ever since I entered kindergarten, I had been on this and we all have been on this sort of assembly line of education, an assembly line, product of the industrial revolution, right? We're gonna get sort of be put together and get our different cogs and then we're gonna sort of come out the end ready to enter into the workforce of America. But my profession was teaching and my profession was theological education and I could see very quickly that those jobs were going by the wayside. There was no new assembly line and instead, I felt like I was in Whitewater Rapids. Um, 
these set of observations and questions eventually led me to take them up in a dissertation capacity. I'm like, okay, surely the church can be helpful here. Surely we can do something with vocational formation. Surely theological education can be part of the hope and the future and the way out. And so I, um, you know, I took up these questions. Basically, um, in a changing world, in independence in particular, basically shoulder burdens that corporations and systems used to. And then secondarily, we need skills not emphasized in traditional education, right? We can't do the whitewater rapid stuff with, you know, sort of being prepared for an assembly line, kind of like you guys were describing. And so I went out and I'm like, okay, who, who does this well? Who is sort of charting the fog well? Well, I'm from a family of teachers and entrepreneurs, so I'm like, the entrepreneurs, they do it well. They at least have an interesting take on that. And so I went and did a bunch of research and sort of found some different commonalities, um, distilled it down into what I would call an entrepreneurial mindset, and then actually found some practices that were really regular and that people did, linked those together um, in almost like a theory of change and have been kind of playing with that for the last year at Fuller. Um, and what we are learning is that if you're borrowing from the playbook of people who chart the fog sort of naturally, for all the people who are like, okay, what exactly do we do? It can become a bit of a playbook for discernment in a changing world of work. So I just, I, I see what you guys are talking about. Like in all my friends, in my own career, certainly many of the people that come through our doors at the Dupree Center and who are hungry for these kind of tools. So I think it's just a really important topic and I appreciate your perspective on it. Yeah. Terry and I have a friend in Pittsburgh, uh, a pastor um, who pastors the campus of a larger church in and uh, the east end of the city, and most of his congregation are sort of 25 to 35 year olds in varying degrees of you know seasons of work. Some of them are college educated, some of them aren't. And he's starting a, 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 a series of talks next week that Terry and I are both going to be participating in through January for this young adult population, and and it's on work. And I I, I remember saying to him, Dennis, really? I, you know, this is this. He said, Lisa. Everybody thinks the, mo the thing that 25-year-olds care about the most and want to talk about the most in church is sex. It's not. They want to do, they have bought into some lies that they have to find work that's, that's high impact and it has to be meaningful and they have to pursue their passion and they don't have a robust theology of work and I need you to come and help put some, some skin on that with me and, and then we're gonna work with them to help them really understand that everyday work, ordinary work matters, right? How, what we put our hands to um, whether it's the caregiving of a child or I'm working at Noodles and Company because that's what I have to do to pay off my college debt, I can bring my identity in Christ to that work, not re require that work to give me my identity in Christ. Um, I love the example of the peanut butter and jelly sandwich. We have a a good friend in Pittsburgh, some of you may know her. Um, she's an Anglican priest, her name is Tish Harrison Warren. And Tish wrote a fabulous book that I commend to all of you called A Liturgy of the Ordinary. And the cover of the book is a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Right? Because what Tish is communicating to us is that, that God is found in those ordinary acts. God is found in the changing of a diaper or the changing of, of, a, of a pick line on a, a, an ill parent. It's found in those ordinary acts and that is in and of itself meaningful work that matters and glorifies God. But we have lost our ability to communicate that and disciple people around that and I think that's at the heart of where we need to go with this. Mm -hmm. And I love what, what you're talking about, Michaela, in giving people some practical tools. Yeah. And if Christine, if I could just, you know, I just affirm, you know, those three questions. Yeah, they're brilliant. And when, I, when I job crafted it and took up a new job description, I, I intentionally did not say I'm a life coach. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there's a lot of life coaches out there. And if you're a life coach, great, fine. How you take that up is, is your work. But I, I think in our culture, it, uh, life coaches help people kind of design their best life, what they think is their best life. Yeah. Uh, but, but in... My space, our space, our best life is, is the life that God has for us. I mean, God's better is always better. Sometimes it's really <laughs> difficult to latch on to that, but that's, that's the work that I'm undertaking in, in my community of faith, helping people listen, who is God, who am I in God's sight, and why am I doing what I'm doing, and res responding to 
The vocation implies there is somebody who is calling. Yeah. Right. And, and there is no be one best life. I think that's another dysfunctional yeah. belief. Like I have to, you know, what's the, I want to be the best version of myself. What in the world does that mean, right? It's not, it's, it's not grounded in the truth and reality of, of how God has created um, us as image bearers or the world that he's created. We might have many versions of how we express our vocation um, in, through the, the course of a lifetime and, and we bring our vocation, I understand vocation and calling to be, you know, my, my, my large vocation is to glorify God in all that I do, but then there's a unique vocation that God's built into me by who he's made me to be, you know, looking at Psalm 139, I am uniquely and wonderfully made. What is my stewardship responsibility to that in every role that I play? So I'm a mother, I'm a wife, I'm a, was an organization leader, I'm a community volunteer, volunteer, all of those roles, now I'm an entrepreneur at 60, who knew? Um, you know, all of those roles are, are how I, I bring myself to those roles. Those roles do not define me. But I, and they may change and shift and morph over time, and I think that's part of what we have to help people understand. How do you bring yourself to the work that God's called you to do at Apple? What does that concretely look like? Knowing that it may change in a year or two, but you're not, you're still who God made you to be because you know who God is and you know who he said you are. Say more. Let me ask a follow-up <laughs> question related to that. Sure. Working at Apple Computer, how does working in the Silicon Valley shape people or form people? And how has it, how has it influenced or affected you? And what are your goals for your Christian affinity group in speaking to that kind of formation that Silicon Valley brings to people? Yeah, what a... <laughs> loaded question. Um, but I will, I guess, go back to the ideas of what work was designed to be. As many of you know, um, that, you know, God is a God who works and mankind is created in the image of a God who works and work is a foundational part of God's creation. It's yep. meant to be a form of service and worship to God that we get to protect and to guard and to keep the things that he himself had made. And it's meant to be done in relationship with others. Yes. It's this beautiful yeah. thing. And yet in our culture, um, Silicon Valley included, but not unique to Silicon Valley, you know, work is often um, one, one thing is it's isolating. Um, it becomes this, this idol as opposed to this form of, of service. And it's what you were describing, this, um, this necessary evil attitude toward work sometimes. It's either, it's either work is who you are or like work doesn't matter. There's sort of that spectrum. Um, but I think one, one concrete thing that I think about a lot is, um, well, Philippians 2 of, um, yeah, considering the interests of, of others mm -hmm. um, and having the mind and humility of Christ. Um, I think that's a very practical thing and that I think about a lot. And then the other thing is, again, with this, this dynamic that work tends to be isolating because you just want to keep doing it sometimes. Either you need to do it to make money in a place like Silicon Valley where the cost of living and everything is high and there is the reality of student debt, there, there are the financial circumstances that are real that we've all talked about. So there's this thing, either you really, really need to work hard to make money or it becomes your idol and you get your fulfillment and your identity all from work. It's one or the other. And in either case, there's a temptation to be isolated and m making friends can be a real challenge that actually requires for you to be super intentional to do it. Mm. Um, and then this idea of loving God and loving your neighbor, like love your coworker, <laughs> that's not a common thing necessarily. We're often very polite to one another. We're, we often collaborate. Um, in a way that's respectful typically so that you can get the work done. Um, but often it can be more transactional because there's so much to be done that I just need to go do what I do and I need enough from you and you need to like me enough so we can go do the thing. But the, the command 
which is not optional, I realize. Commands apparently are not optional. So when Jesus says, love God and love your neighbor as yourself, I'm like, okay, well, I guess I should try to do it. (laughs) Right? I guess I should try to do it. I guess I should try to love the people that work around me. I guess I should try to love that difficult person that I have to work with over there. And I have to try to love them in and through my emails, in and through the way I conduct my meetings, in and through the way that I pass by or have a conversation or whatever it might look like. um, That truly this idea of walking in love as Christ loved me and being an imitator of God as his beloved children. Ephesians 5, 1 through 2, like that, these ideas in the Bible, like what does that practically look like? So I do think it's an intentional kind of daily pursuit of love in and through my character, relationships, and the quality of my work each day in whatever role I have, because roles can change and they fluctuate, projects change and fluctuate, the expectations of your job can change and fluctuate, but the motivation for me is to live in intentional obedience to the things that Jesus commands. Um, which in a VUCA world, it's very helpful to have those things that I just know and don't need to question Amen. are true and trustworthy. How do your affinity groups and your vision for that fit in? Yeah, so I guess for those who are not familiar, there are these things called employee resource groups that are found in a lot of larger corporations, Fortune 500 companies, et cetera. I think in the U.S. they started in the 60s. Um, I think Xerox is known to be one of the first companies to establish employee resource groups or affinity groups. Um, Historically, they have um, been focused on like uh, racial identity or gender-based identity. And so a lot of companies, including Apple, will have like the women employee resource group, or like the African American employee resource group, the Asian employee resource group, so on and so forth. And um, increasingly, you know, companies have also begun to explore this area of identity called faith. So there are faith-based employee resource groups that have begun to form. And um, at Apple, we have multiple faith-based employee resource groups. And there's different models of them that you'll find in different companies. So within um, companies like like Apple or Intel, um, Cisco, et cetera, there are individual faith-specific employee resource groups, like the Apple Christian Fellowship or the, you know, the Intuit Christian Action Network, um, so on and so forth. And then at other companies like a Google or a Salesforce, there are interfaith employee resource groups like Salesforce, Faithforce, or the Google Interbelief Network. And you can go, or the Facebook Interfaith Network. And then within these employee resource groups of faith that are faith-based, there are communities of, of Christians or people of faith that come together, um, ultimately with the goal of positively impacting the company. Right? And we do believe that impacting people positively impacts the business. Um, and that shows up in a lot of different ways. So I guess I, without going into so much specifics, I think as, a, as an employee resource group under the umbrella of you know, strengthening the culture of inclusion and diversity within the company, we do all that we can to foster um, community and belonging and serving employees. Um, so that they can bring their whole best selves to work, including their faith. Mm. And for myself, motivated by Christ's love, and as a first-generation Filipino immigrant woman who spent her entire career in the tech industry, being a minority in many rooms, I am very committed for many reasons to be a part of building a culture of inclusion um, in my workplace, um, including inclusion for faith. And so that's what drives me. And ultimately for the Apple Christian Fellowship, we fall under that umbrella of being a part of strengthening the culture of inclusion and diversity so that everyone belongs. Thank you, Christine. That's very exciting. In my conversation when we met yesterday, I made a connection uh, for the last several years my husband and I have been hosting one of our Master of Divinity students from our seminary, uh, Sukanya Iti Chaituran. And she is from Thailand. And she came to know Jesus as an executive in the General Motors Thailand 
faith-based group. Isn't that neat? Mm. So she has connections in GM all over the world of, of employees that have come to know Jesus through these affinity groups. So it's really a, a wonderful idea. Yeah. Thank you for your leadership in that area. Delano, let me ask you about your work life because you've been working in, in multiple sectors, kind of a, a bifurcated vocational work. How has that helped you uh, and others in the FUI sphere? Sure, I, I had the rich privilege of understanding that every job I've obtained, and I'm sure we all understand this to some degree, but I am painfully aware that I don't deserve any employment that I have obtained. I got my job as an engineer, I walked off a stage of high school, I'm in Kansas City, Missouri, moving to Kansas City, Missouri as an engineer, as an intern, the next week. So I have no knowledge about engineering and walking into a job after walking off of a stage in high school because I happened to be at a school for my senior year because I had transferred because of some things that occurred from some friends that I lost uh, before that. So. God's moving things around in order for some opportunities to come. One of the rich benefits of that, though, is that when I graduated from college, um, I had done pretty much everything I was going to do um, as an engineer for that particular company. And so there was some of this what now type of experience. So I immediately went into enroll in seminary because I wanted to learn Hebrew and go on digs. And so while a lot of my seminary friends were... Um, you know, going to study in the library to spend the rest of the day entrenched in theology. Uh, I'm learning hypostatic union, and then I'm trying to make sense of that while I'm calculating yield stress on uh, steel connections at work. Mm. <laughs> so I'm marrying the two already. Um, and then when I'm graduating in the mid-2000s with my MDiv and thinking, okay, because the natural next step when you graduate from, from college is, okay, let me go put this into application. Uh, God says, no, you're not moving from engineering. You're going to stay right where you are. And so what immediately began to happen is as I'm watching friends go into, quote, unquote, full-time ministry, because I was using that terminology then, I'm finding that God's present right there in the work that I have to do there. Um, and so these questions are starting to be pushed about what is God doing in engineering? What is he doing with the people that I'm working with? And if he never lets me leave this place, was the MDiv degree worth nothing? And then simultaneously, is the engineering worth nothing? And I had to reconcile those two while dealing with a lot of church experience, which is saying that church work is up here and the rest of the work that's being done is great as long as you're giving, right? So um, I transitioned into working for a church uh, six, seven, eight years later. Um, and that benefit was that it helped me to really think about the fact that we have to affirm the dignity of every type of work, and it's very important. So I think there's two things that I've really realized through that is that people uh, spend 30% of their life in one place. Um, we ought to affirm that because that's, that's a good consistency about being patient and about enduring and about doing good work well, and that should be affirmed. Um, we take a lot of celebratory acts about people in ministry for churches and that kind of thing, but what about those people who endure and do good work on these jobs for 10, 15, 20 years, especially when we see people change jobs so often now? Um, so what that has translated to for me is working with people at the church is uh, really two things. Number one, um, I wish I would have had Tish Harrison's uh, material a few years ago, but I think I was saying things very similar to that, um, is really reminding them about God's presence, mm -hmm. the Emmanuel that we call him. Let's not just make it a title, right? If God is present, mm -hmm. what is he doing there? And if it's his kingdom and he has say over it, what does he have to say about the work that you're doing, right? Um, I'm an engineer by nature. By nature, I'm thinking how much stuff is going on around us just to keep this building up yeah. off the ground in this very moment. And that's because God is sustaining the laws that he's put in place. There's never a point where he's going to say, gravity, stop. <laughs> right? He keeps it going. And so someone designed this taking into account whether they know because they follow God or whether because of common grace 
that God's laws, his natural laws in this case, are at work. And we can use those to make things that we have around us. So for the people that I work with, I remind them in very candid ways that you need to see his presence and help me see what you see about how he's involved. Let me give you a quick example. There's a, a number of people who are business owners. I sent them a text on New Year's Day to say, what are your plans for this year? What are you hoping to occur? You don't have to give me all of them. You don't have to give me any of them. I just want to pray for you. So if you want to share them with me, great. There's a landscaper um, who sent me a message back, and it sounded very church-ish. Let me say that. Very biblical. I want to do the fruits of the, of the Spirit, and I want to um, make sure that God is exalted and glorified. And all that's true. But I had to redirect him to ask him, what does that mean when you're cutting the grass? Yeah. What does that mean when you're involved in this day-to-day -day operation of what you do? And, and we, we kept tearing back and forth, and his answers were very much Galatians. And I, I kept pushing a little further into it. I just asked him, I was like, do you realize when you edge the edge of a, a sidewalk, you are like Genesis 128-ing that edge? <laughs> and what I think he started to realize is what I was hoping that he sees is, is God is involved in your edging. Yeah. He's involved in that grass. He's involved in the trees that you cut back. He's involved in trimming and subduing things to make them look well. Mm. So help me to see that so that you can see it as well and we can learn together. So start asking the questions that I can't answer for you because I'm not a landscaper, right? I have too many allergies. I can't do that. The second one I try to do is remind them is to consider the lilies, right? It, if, if, he, if he, you think about how many shades of brown are in that carpet. God is infinitely incredible in how much he creates. And he dresses everything well, but how much more important are we? So as a landscaper, you're very important. And what we tend to try to do at our church is remind people, if you remove you and don't replace you, what happens to the people around you and to the things around you? There's a, a young lady who was just processing paperwork overnight for a hospital, and she said, I'm just a, and we hear that kind of language. Yeah. Uh, we send the, tend to hear that for certain professions, or when people mess up, then they feel like they're just a, and we have to be careful about letting people think they're just a something. Um, I reminded her, if you don't do your job and you're not there, what happens to a family that gets a bill that's now $125,000 instead of the $5,000 it could be? How much stress does that add to a person to think, I've got a family member who's sick and a bill that's so absorbent I don't know how to deal with it? which may not be true, but that's stress. Anybody got a bill that you didn't want to get, mm. right? We all experience that. We're reminding them to consider the lilies, that they are important as well. And so those are the two things we really try to do. Help me see how God is present and involved in some of the most mundane things that you may be involved in. And number two, you're very important. And if nobody else reminds you you're important, I'm going to be there to remind you of that as well. Yeah, I, d I just want to comment on that really quickly. I think it's so important that one of the things we sometimes lose sight of in this faith and work movement is um, that God cares deeply about the particulars of our work itself. He cares about the material world. So, so th the best form of evangelism that a landscaper can provide is really good edges, right? <laughs> it's not to show up with a, a, cross on, a cross on the back of his truck, although that might not be a bad thing either, right? But, but we forget that. We don't pay it. We think it's, it's all this sort of, you know, I want the fruits of the spirit, and it's not about the, the actual work itself. So the scaffolding that you see around the city, that's beautiful scaffolding. It's meaningful. It matters to what God's doing in the world. It's, it's, it's important for us to remember the particulars of our work, even in the simplest things, are super important. Amen. <laughs> Michaela, you shared with us some of the process of your dissertation. Could you tell us your findings and the next steps you're doing at Fuller now? Yeah, okay. Um, mm -hmm. Let me first say that my findings were really encouraging, uh, mostly because they were, well, they were really Christian. I mean, sure, like everybody <laughs> I like interviewed was a Christian, but I was like, oh, we can do this. Oh, we can do that. Um, I, I did a bunch of, you know, you do rounds of stuff, um, rounds of nominations, rounds of surveys. Uh, my favorite stuff came from some in-depth interviews where I more or less asked people five questions, which is just like, tell me how you got started, you know, the Genesis story. And then um, I asked, how have you learned to define success? How have you learned to define failure? What practices have moved you towards success? And what practices have helped you deal with failure? 
And that was like where I just, I had to like basically zip my lip because you're not supposed to, you know, engage with people. You're supposed to just be like writing and nodding your head. Uh, but it was gold. It was good. Um, and most of what I found, this is a dissertation project, would be supported in like the wider body of literature. Um, and so first, uh, one, like when I just sort of just distilled down, like what actually is this like entrepreneurial spirit? What is it? There, there, there's a bunch of stuff, but three things that I think are really interesting here. And that is that people um, were creative, they were resilient, and they were relational. Mm. And as I started like really plowing through these things, I'm like, oh man, that's our first story about God, our climactic story in Christ, and hello, the church. And that, I was like, whoa, it's right there. It's like very like Christian DNA. I think we've, from this stage a couple times this weekend, we've heard that like the world really is groaning for like the good news. And I'm like, okay, so that, that's helpful. That's helpful. Um, and then there were these practices. And I did not define for all the academics in the room wondering which definition of practices I used. I purposely let the respondents take that where they might because I'm like, well, what, you know, what do you do? What's like your actual life look like? And the very, very thing that came to the very top was my favorite part of all the research. And that was, you know, people who had gotten 10 million in VC, who had started, you know, billion dollar microfinancing companies, mom and pop shops on the corner for 30 years. The thing they had most in common was that they practiced empathy. Mm. Empathy. And I'm like, oh, that feels really Christian. That feels like <laughs> you do something with that. Um, and it's not just that they practice empathy, it's that they could convert that empathy. I'm thinking about Kitty now because you're like, I would like, you know, you're the exemplar now. They could convert that empathy into imagination, mm -hmm. right? They could convert the empathy into imagination. But it wasn't just that they're full of imagination. I mean, entrepreneurs and these people, you know, imagination sounds a lot like, what if, what if, what if? But then there's this move where you actually let imagination fuel risk taking. And you say, like, let's try, let's try, let's try. And it wasn't just that entrepreneurs were great with empathy and that they were so imaginative and that they could take risk. Surprisingly to me, there was this reflection built in. Every single one of them talked about uh, really particular pra uh, practices and processes of reflection quarterly with other people. Um, just, it was really, really mind blowing to me that they stop and ask what happened. How to go? How can we get better? What do we need to throw away? What do we need to prune? Right? Um, and so what, what I thought was we could, we could even just some of the, the ways I tied them together, that's me tying them together. I'm like, what if we like did this with people? What if we did this process with people? Mm -hmm. And so we've been testing it. And I, I think I've, I've told a couple of you here that in our first couple of beta rounds, the feedback was this. I have no idea what I just did, but it sort of changed my life. <laughs> And I was like, okay, that's interesting. Um, and so we've been, we being the Dupree Center, my team, we've been seeing if we can keep that process open-handed and sort of like chase it a little bit rather than say, here's exactly what it is. And for me, I'm a practical theologian. Like this is theological education in a like remixed form. And the people who are most drawn to this are people who are in transition. They're like, I need something. Help me figure out X, Y, or Z. And we've come to realize that what, we loose, what I loosely call practices are really a set of like discernment tools. And that, it, you know, borrowed from this playbook of entrepreneurs who know how to press into the fog, that the rest of us have something very Christian to learn about that. And the last thing I'll say is that you know, there's a strong link between how empathy and imagination help cultivate creativity mm. and how risk-taking and reflection help cultivate resilience, and that when done with other people, the process uh, both escalates and is much more formational. Um, so that, that's, that's what I, we're, we're playing with, and it's definitely early, like all, like all things are, but that, that's kind of what I'm up to. That's awesome. So interesting, thank you all. We're going to move to some of the questions that have been contributed through Slido, and this is one of the top questions. So anyone and everyone may speak to this. What sectors of the economy are going to be most disruptive, most disrupted by smart machines and artificial intelligence in the next few years? I think that has to go to Apple. <laughs> <laughs> She's a, you start. <laughs> um, I would say 
any activity that is, what's the best word for this? Things that are sort of redundant. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I'm not going to point to any single industry because right. there are examples of this. So things that a human would do, but it's like a repetitive thing. And then you do it every day, you do it every week, it's just the same thing. If it's a re repetitive activity, um, it will more than likely be a candidate for automation sooner rather than later. Versus the things that are kind of more dynamic and more complex, such as creating or, um, you know, even different aspects of like, ultimately like de decision making, like making the call. I, I do think machines are gonna be very good at analyzing large quantities of information and collecting that information. But um, I think it will be a while until we're gonna be comfortable truly just trusting a machine mm -hmm. for potentially high risk or expensive decisions. I think there's still gonna be a human element there, but the, the, the process of decision making and the ability to, for humans to like absorb um, and, and come to a high quality decision in a collaborative way is gonna to continue to be a skill that like we need to continue to cultivate together because the problems that the world is facing there, there are just different types of problems, different types of questions that no one has ever asked before. Um, and it's gonna take partnership, different kinds, forms of partnership to truly innovate and understand how to respond. But my short answer there is anything that is potentially redundant um, and in, in any industry, um, but the things that are uniquely human uh, will remain something um, that will be left for us. Mm. So the question then becomes, what does it mean to be human? But that's a whole nother, <laughs> that's a whole nother question, but yeah. That, that question is way above my pay grade. And I had a, a moment of just sheer panic when you talked about redundancy and, and I thought about the redundant practice of corporate liturgy. <laughs> <laughs> But you encouraged me about the, the human element. So you're, you're not replaceable anytime soon, Terry? But if you think about the whole church space, how, how it's been disrupted yeah. uh, by technology, uh, uh, how, many, how many people have checked out of organized uh, corporate worship space and you know, via podcast and live streaming and, and that whole space. Uh, yeah, uh, is there a need for local churches and local church leadership when you can just stream it? You know, last year um, at the, uh, I was part of the Faith and Work Summit uh, that happened in Chicago, and um, one of the, the uh, main stage sessions was around the future of work, and uh, a friend of ours, some of you know Missy Wallace, um, did a little research, and it was very interesting to me. Um, she, she pulled some pastors, to find out how much time they had been spending thinking about the future of work and the discipleship of the people in their congregations around some of these disruptions and changes. Um, and I don't remember all her statistics exactly, but it was pretty dismal, generally, right? Um, and, and it makes me think about, you know, what is the role of the church in helping um, helping people who are anxious about the possibility that their job may be eliminated um, because of automation and artificial intelligence, and how do we take up some of that as part of the, the, the addressing of this, this VUCA world we're in? Because I think there's a lot of anxiety out there. It feels very unknown and uncertain, um, and yet you know, people keep thinking about the future of work as out there, and it's coming, and I gotta tell you, it's here. Every one of you, I think, if you don't have a smartphone, raise your hand. Anybody in the room not have a smartphone? Not one, right? It's here. Automation is here. We talk to Siri. We rely on GPS. All of that is automation, right? So it's already very present and penetrated in our lives, and we still have mentally, we think about it as not here yet. And I think that's part of where the anxiety comes from, right, is that it's, 
we're not recognizing the reality of it being already present in, in, our, in our daily lives. And so, you know, part of what we have in the gospel is going back to those core truths to say, we don't, we, we can be anxious about those things, but we also know the God of, of the universe is still in charge. And that, that sounds big and esoteric, but there's reality to that that can keep us grounded in the everyday anxiety. Back to your, I keep going back to your three questions because I think they're <laughs> awesome. I also, you know, want to invite another question, which is less about what might be taken away as a result of automation mm -hmm. and AI, but, you know, an exploration of, hey, what, what might actually be possible that we cannot do today that right. we might be able to do in the future, whether that's in healthcare and being able to diagnose and treat people more effectively, or whether you're a church leader and how might you use AI and automation and more advanced analytics to actually support your disciple making? Um, and and what, what might those possibilities be yep. as opposed really to good. being afraid of losing something? What if we might actually gain more than what we are able awesome. to do today? Good. Another question submitted by the audience is, the big question for me is, so what does this mean for seminary leaders listening to Lisa and Terry? How will we change the way we do theological teaching? My experience in seminary, as I, as I said, it gave me a robust theological education. Uh, but my seminary experience did not uh, pay much attention to human formation. Uh, what does it mean to lead? Uh, what does it mean to provide organizational support? Uh, but I would say even, even more importantly, how, how do I, seminary did not help me understand my unique image bearing and how I bring that into my work. Mm. Uh, and fortunately, I've had spiritual directors and therapists and a wise spouse and brothers and sisters in Christ who have walked with me through my pastoral work who have helped me understand how I uniquely carry God's image and have helped me bring that into my work uh, day in and day out. Uh, that would have been very helpful for me to have that more of that on the front end uh, than picking it up along the way. Uh, so uh, what can seminaries do to, uh, to help form leaders in their, their, the human formation piece? Uh, that I think is critical. Uh, and I, I'd, I'd love to hear what seminaries are, you know, seminaries in the room are doing in, in, in that space, but that, that, would be, that would be my response to that. Um, so yesterday morning, uh, I had an assignment um, from Greg Forrester to, to spend some time with the, the Oikonomia Network Steering Committee, um, and my, the, the question that he asked me to respond to was, um, why aren't seminaries forming flourishing pastors, and what should we be doing about that? Um, and, I, and I'm a you know, practitioner who's worked with lots of pastors post-seminary who are in various stages of vocational disintegration. So I was to come with stories from the field. And about a month ago, um, I started to get nervous about the presentation, and so I did what any self-respecting 21st century consultant does. I did a survey monkey um, and put together five questions, uh, and, and in all my brilliance and timeliness, sent it out on December 15th to 140 pastors. Great time of year to ask pastors to respond, right? Um, but I got back 42 or 43 responses, and it was super interesting to me um, what they said. And I asked them questions like, did your seminary form you holistically? Um, and, and what kind of formation did it offer? Did they equip you for congregational leadership uh, and, and organizational development? And did they care about developing you personally, vocationally? Did they provide you with spiritual director and mentor? And the results were very interesting. There were some, you know, it was, it was a little divided, a little skewed to the negative, but not as much as I thought it would be. Um, but there's a hunger out there to seminary educators. And I'm, you know, Greg has assured me, I said I did unscientific research. He's assured me it's not as unscientific as I think it is, but it's a sampling and it, it served its purpose, which is to stimulate conversation for the steering committee. But I think there's a huge need to start and create readiness in, as part of theological education around not just the intellectual formation, but also the emotional formation and the spiritual formation, the vocational formation of your seminary students. Pastors cannot disciple others if they have not been discipled mm. themselves period. 
And there are lots of pastors out there who are trying and failing, and people are not being fully discipled. And that's, you know, Terry and I have been having this conversation for as long as we've known each other. How do we help pastors? It's what Made to Flourish has committed itself to. How do we help pastors be better disciples themselves mm. and in order to disciple others? You cannot give away what you don't possess. And theological education has a vital place and role in equipping pastors or, or men and women who will become pastors, not just to be brilliant theologians and craft good sermons, um, but also to be, form, you know, to be true pastors and formers of, of the, the people that are, God has placed in their care. I love Terry's shift to vocational coaching at the core mm. of what he does with, as a disciple maker is vocationally oriented around the roles of all of his people. Um, and so I think there's a lot that can be done and, and I think that um, there are lots of other resources. Here's the key and I think this is a theme I've seen emerging throughout the whole Quran Forum is you do not, theological educational institutions, have to do this by yourselves. There are lots of great people and organizations out there that can partner and collaborate with you, including local congregations who can become laboratories for some of your seminarians who can have residency experiences and internships. So, so it, it's going to require churches to learn how to partner, I know. I think it's possible. Um, seminaries to learn how to partner. But this is, we got to break down the walls and build this collaboration, collaborative network. And so I love what, what, what you're doing out in Fuller and how you're thinking about this in Kansas City because I think this is, we've got to cross these, these false divides and barriers that we've created to, to partner together for the, for the kingdom, right? This is kingdom partnership and kingdom collaboration we're trying to build. I'll just add one thing, and that is, um, okay, so volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. I have not met a seminary professor that wouldn't describe their own institution like that. Mm. Yeah. So I actually think that facing both eyes forward, heart fully looking on, the like change, the lament, the craziness of our churning profession is an incredible well to draw from mm. in equipping people for that, this kind of world. Yeah. So I'm like, it's right there in front of us. And, and to me, that's a painful embrace. It actually is. But it, talk about a, um, being formed and then you know, sort of modeling and being able to empathize with where we're sending people. So, so for me, it's like getting in touch with that, that change and being honest about it actually tees us up to um, engage with students in a really particular mm. way. Amen. That's good. I'm just a Greek teacher, so mine's going to be very practical. Just a... Uh... Just a... <laughs> just a add to. Um, you, you give quizzes, right? So I don't have a, a lot of philosophical side. I'm kind of dating myself, but there's some things that were mentioned last night that made me think, and I think I'm pulling from my sixth grade mom teaching class. They had those transparencies they used to use on the overhead. It would be good, and this is, it'll come into technology in the way it is today, but it'd be nice to see um, these principles that we teach and that we're trying to infuse in these students on transparency and then send them out into the world looking through that lens mm. at everything around them, right? So what happens is then, if you can't make sense of what you're looking at through that lens, you need to spend a little more time looking at it. And then the other part about it is that's just one degree. You have 360 degrees, that's like engineering coming out of me now, of looking at the world through that, and what that helps you to do is, one, you have to stay humble because you're not gonna ever know it all, and number two, there's a lot more to learn, right? There's a lot more to learn. So if we can find ways to make it very practical, I know we do it sometimes, you see it in seminary and in evangelism area, go out, share the gospel, experience that kind of thing. But what if that starts to happen in every course? We want you to learn this. You've got to get this orthodoxy down, but we really want you to get the orthopraxy. Mm. What you've got, that's great. You've got it here, but let's see what it looks like in hands and heart. And what I think they'll start to realize is that there's a lot to be learned through the experience of it, looking at the world through the eyes of God, through the eyes of Jesus. Um, I think that's it. That's all. I'll leave it there. Just one thought. Um, as we talk about discipling people in the new economy, I think um, the, the, the thing that is sure to 
inhibit the growth of any disciple is a lack of reading the Bible and praying. <laughs> you can only go so far as a follower of Jesus, and you might be able to do a lot of great things for a season, but without this, this foundational like abiding <laughs> with Jesus, and particularly um, a daily engagement with the word of God, there, that growth is gonna, it's gonna be inhibited. And so um, one thing that I was very privileged to have growing up in the church, and I had a pastor, Pastor Joe, who um, had a doctorate, but he was also very, um, very giving of his seminary education to his congregation, especially those of us in leadership, that he brought it in. He brought it, he brought it in, he taught us um, how to explore the word of God for ourselves. Um, and I think that is one of the um, things that I, I am most grateful for is um, to have had church leaders like Pastor Joe who helped me engage the Bible with questions that I had because the Bible, actually, I realized as I got older, it, 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 it can inform every area of my life. Absolutely. Um, I grew up in the church, and I remember going to Sunday school, being taught, read the Bible, and pray. And when I got to middle school, I was like, well, are you guys going to teach me anything else? Because read the Bible and pray, I was like, I get it. But then as I got older, I'm like, wow, those are actually really sacred, like <laughs> fundamental things that I need to intentionally do these things every single day. And that is, that is what helps me grow in the likeness of Jesus. And so, you know, my ask is, you know, how do we, how do we democratize theological education and make the Bible fun again for everyone? Amen. Amen. Would you thank the panelists with me? It was wonderful. Thank you, each one.